Hello, hello. Can people hear me? We can. Yes, yeah, but we Good don't see you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I always forget to turn my chat off, and then, you know, all sorts of wonderful people send me messages during my talks of the form, what are you talking about? And then, anyway, um, so I've turned that off. Uh, hopefully, you can see my screen, and it looks purple. Well, then, now it looks white with purple, but yeah, it looks yeah. white with purple, even better. So, so let me finish up. Uh, the ecosystem ebits, if that's all right, and uh, hopefully there'll be something interesting uh, there. And you know, economics sounds dry, but really, it's a, it's a huge driver of what we do. So this is what I'm going to talk about. And here's a picture of an ecosystem. Look at it in its beautiful, glorious richness. So I want to look at the uh, the incentives that people have that are uh, in our project, and look at some of the different kinds of things. So I start, of course, with volunteers, um, people who get involved there, um, and th there are several basic human interaction types. And this sort of kin selection, this mutualism, share and share alike, is, is an important way that people interact. And uh, you know, I don't want to do anything to diminish that, but I think there are often other motivations that help here. So it's not just the fun and the friendship and the um, that sort of stuff, but also people love to get mentoring and they learn to learn things, uh, improve their CV, they can get certified. Um, interestingly, people used to get job titles in the open office days and be able to charge money for being the lead of whatever uh, at open office at conferences. Um, lots of people love their native languages and so they, they transfer that, you know, mutualism of uh, love of nation into, into the project and they do a great job um, making it uh, work in Welsh or, or whatever. Um, some people care passionately about software liberty. Uh, personally, and they do that, and other people care, you know, deeply about giving um, something freely to, to you know, poor people who can't afford it otherwise. Um, and lots of people in the ecosystem, you know, the ecosystem, I talk about companies, companies don't, don't really exist. Um, the foundations don't really exist either. Um, it's just a group of people who work together and, you know, often get paid, obviously, uh, but there, there's still a whole load of individuals there, and it's good to see that. Uh, there. So, so there's volunteers, and then there's the rest of the ecosystem, which broadly works on reciprocity. Um, you know, uh, I pay you something and you do something for me, you know, uh, something like this. And this is another very fundamental, uh, one, one of the three major uh, relationship types that at least Stephen Pinker uh, pulls out in his, his, his thinking. And so I'll go through some of these uh, different kinds. So first of all, there are corporate contributors. Um, you know, they, they, they get customers to pay them money and they get goods and services back. Obviously, the customers get that. And then they give this back to the community. They uh, they publish it back as false, they are embedded in the community. These are the good guys, I hope. And hopefully you know these people. Uh, you know, there's Red Hat, CIB Lanido, Agalia, well, some of these people are no longer there, but th there are a lot of you know, people contributing there into the ecosystem, we should be thanking them. Of course, perhaps that's not entirely altruistic. Um, they also have goals such as you know, reducing maintenance cost, uh, motivating their staff, and, and fundamentally marketing. You know, I think the contribution back uh, to a project is, is is an important part of showing competence and uh, you know certainly to larger customers uh, that, that is perhaps absent uh, elsewhere so um, then there are a whole load of people who treat a free labor office as a complement to their business so if you read joel on software he has a whole load of uh, things about open source and complementary uh, products so here LibreOffice forms only part of the air offer it's it's LibreOffice plus something and that plus can be all sorts of things, and I'll look at some on the next next page. Um, but broadly, if you're if you're charging um, for Mike, something that includes the offers, your Mike, motivation is to get your complement, the, the the other bit, the price of that, right down, down, ideally to zero, because you have a choice. You you can either you know be paying something for LibreOffice and something for me, or you can be getting it all for you and very much less for LibreOffice. So so there is a logic to not contributing back. If you see offer, uh, LibreOffice as a complement to your business, and there are a large number of projects and, and uses of LibreOffice where this is the case, and people try to get that cost down, it's remarkably popular. So very, very often, people will sell services around uh, free LibreOffice deployments, and the whole use case and the, the financials and the model is based entirely on having the cost saving from gratis uh, Office which then creates more money to be spent on migration and training. I think this is a particularly uh, self-defeating way of doing it uh, because selling consultancy this year, uh, rather than a long-term product relationship over 20 years, is just selling yourself way short. Why not get that money you know, the next year and the next year and the next year? Um, but still, it, it does uh, happen a lot. 
And so, you know, as we talk about marketing uh, and how that affects the ecosystem, a tag, you know, is, is a particularly simple way to clarify where that might be okay, you know, so I don't know, personal or unsupported or whatever, making it clear that actually, you know, the, the top guy here where nothing, you know, nothing much goes back to the project is, is really not, not cool. Um, we, we see this, this strategy used by billion dollar first world companies. I, I, I've been amazed to see people unwilling to pay, uh, you know, for, for any fixes uh, because, well, you know, we filed it upstream as a looking like a volunteer and maybe someone will fix it for us. Um, at Calabra, we have people using the development edition code and deploying that in hosting environments and charging people money for it left and right. And of course, that's, you know, the license allows that, that's okay. Um, but it's, again, getting that cost of the complement to your service uh, right down to zero. And of course, we see individuals, and, and particularly more so in the open office times, selling support services to people. So they would literally front a support service, which was just filing bugs in the, Libra, in the open office bugzilla, and then perhaps hassling a sun engineer to do it or trying to hold up releases until those bugs were fixed. With effectively no competence, uh, no, no engineering competence uh, behind that and no contribution to LibreOffice underneath that, um, but still uh, quite a successful model. And we'll look at some of these, um, these things there. It's obviously a lot cheaper. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so, so of course, in terms of then trying, trying to pretend you have a roadmap or, or that you're actually going somewhere, um, you need then to, uh, you know, do, <laughs> do a fair bit of work to try and work out what other people are going to do for you for free in advance and then tell people that's what they're going to get. And you know you can predict these things. And to be fair, big companies have trouble predicting what they're gonna do anyway. So it's, it's not like if there's a few errors in your guesses uh, that it'll go really wrong. And so the hope someone else fixes your bugs uh, product here. Um, and and uh, it's easy to point the finger at other people and say that sucks, but it, it's also, I'm part of the problem, you know, here I am, I'm using OpenSUSE, I'm not, not paying for a enterprise supported uh, Linux desktop and that, that kind of sucks, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not optimal. Um, and, you know, some amount of the argument, the gratis LibreOffice is really vital, is actually a demand for a free compliment and to, to ultimately a demand to not have to contribute or not, not be encouraged to contribute and continue uh, with that model. Here's an example of this. So, um, you know, uh, Zimbra Docs comes with available at no extra charge, uh, LibreOffice Online or Calabra Online. And you can look at that in various different ways. It's good that they're distributing our software, but it's also a great shame that they're not, you know, pro pro contributing anything back in whatever way that, that uh, you know, would be best. Zimbra are far from the only, uh, only people doing this, um, but they have a pretty website. So there you go. There's another model, which is even more, uh, well, perhaps perhaps more pathological, I don't know. Um, so uh, when it comes to competitive tendering, uh, there is a very easy way to reduce the price and ensure that you win. It's essentially uh, leverage the community, used to be one way uh, that I think advocates would call this. But basically it's bid very low and hope someone else fixes the issues for you. And so, you know, you put a very small amount into uh, a thing. And of course, your bid is always going to be cheaper than people who actually do the job um, and, you know, offer a, a, for a real, real service. Um, and so in this case, you don't actually get more money for yourself. Like it's not all going to the, the individual. It's just disappearing from the whole ecosystem. You know, like we lose, lose that other half, the true cost of fixing and, and providing the service. And yeah, so, I mean, this... You know, I'd like to think that at least someone is getting rich off our work in the other in the other environment, but um, in this one, we, you know, like no one wins. Um, and there are really promised, prominent examples around the world of this going on, particularly in France. Um, but but also, if you consider the the extreme version of this, where effectively you charge nothing at all, which is ultimately where this goes to in the limit. Um, that also demonetizes what, what's potentially an opportunity to contribute uh, significantly to LibreOffice. Here's another model. Um, this is the differentiated low contribution model. So you take the software and then you differentiate. You host it somewhere else on an unclear base. You make it difficult for code changes to go back. You ask for help and mentoring and you ask for fixes for your problems. Sometimes you even raise funds from governments to create a local office that is the one for your 
your you know local area uh, and then you publish your code because i suppose you have to eventually in an unusable form um and you don't engage the developer community or contribute anything which is essentially creating a semi-proprietary local version now this is a very um there are huge advantages to this. It's then very easy to differentiate. You have a clear message. We are the local version. We are the, you know, it's a red flag. You know, we are the, the Chinese government's version. You know, we are the, the official something or other. And it, and it works better in Chinese and um, all, all this sort of thing. And we see this today in Taiwan with uh, OSSII. But it's, it seems it, it's a popular model. It provides instant differentiation. And, well, there you are. Some people do that. Um, TDF, of course, is an economic entity here. I, I guess it's generalized reciprocity, but we expect people to donate or give to give in return for this, this office suite that we've given them. The promise is something like this, you know, we TDF created and gave you an office suite, so join us and contribute to making it better. Of course, there's a couple of open questions there in the footnotes. Uh, you know, so, so the degree to which TDF creates the value that it ships is open to question. And you know the perception that donating then goes to create new feature function is also currently open to question. But, but at least TDF is an economic entity in its own ecosystem with a effectively free or donation funded uh, product. And, and that's great because I mean, TDF does loads of hard to fund otherwise work, let's call it that. You know, there are, there are wonderful stuff done every day with donations uh, from our, our generous donors. Um, which, which are really good and we would struggle to do otherwise. But, but even so, it's a small percentage of the development work that comes uh, through that route. So other economic models, book authoring. Um, perhaps there's a smaller market. Interestingly, print book sales are actually up, which is weird. Um, and our documentation team, I guess, fills the, much of this gap. Um, ODF Authors raises money and uses that revenue to help fund uh, documentation and various other cool things. Um, Interestingly, the, the, the pressures that you want there are, you know, if you're selling physical books, you want fewer major releases of LibreOffice, so you have, have longer print runs serving more people. You want less user interface change, because that requires remaking screenshots. And, you know, a slower release schedule is generally uh, <laughs> appreciated to try and keep, you know, because the more cool things we do, the more we devalue the value of their asset, which is the book, which is, which is interesting. Um, there are lots of other models out there. I mean, like selling conference tickets raised significant money for GNOME. Obviously, in a global pandemic, it doesn't. Um, but I think the Moodle uh, project, you know, makes loads of money through training large groups of uh, um, teachers at conferences. Uh, you can sell news. There's lots of other sort of economic ways that you can um, engage in, in the ecosystem. So brands and trademarks. I, I talk a lot about brands. I'm sorry, but uh, this is partly why. So this uh, recently, uh, for whatever reason, the Document Foundation um, lapsed the, the trademark for LibreOffice Vanilla in the in the App Store. So we couldn't use that anymore. So we pulled it and we put uh, we just left Collabora Office in there. So this is the Apple uh, App Store, and this is daily numbers. And you'll see these graphs have slightly different scales on them here. Um, so there's about 150 or so seats a week uh, that we would normally sell. And in the week that it was down, you know, Collabora Office, unfortunately, a slightly different price. Um, so maybe the number, you know, so this 18 to 150 is probably a bit larger. Um, so, I, you know, looking back, I should have, uh, we should have done a head to head comparison there. But, but for about this week, uh, we saw there was a 10x uh, win of having the more widely known LibreOffice brand. It's the same software, but if you call it something different, uh, people want it more. Um, so brands are really important. And I guess this is not news. We know this problem well. Shoot, someone question or do? I mean, we spend a lot of time and effort building the open office brand only to see it used against us and, uh, and its users, arguably. I mean, the trademark is really the traditional point of proprietization in, in floss projects. And you can see now the open office brand is, is, is a, you know, half or two fifths of the, uh, the LibreOffice one in terms of the Google trend. But, uh, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a big problem. And, uh, you know, trademarks and brands are, you know, peg that explains value. So, hey, well, let's use the LibreOffice brand. Let's everybody use it. It's all, you know, it's 10 times more effective than anything else. Problem is, at this point, you get extreme commoditization. Uh, none of these things are differentiated. No one knows which one they should buy. Uh, and so, in consequence, they buy the cheap one. So, here we see a screenshot of the Windows App Store, and we've got LibreOffice Vanilla, LibreOffice powered by CIB and LibreOffice unofficial, all at different prices, all apparently LibreOffice. 
And this is another problem. So, so you know, if <laughs> differentiating products in the marketplace, if if we have competing products, and I would argue that this is a good thing, um, is 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 it's not obvious how this can be done with commodity branding or, or everyone using the same brand. So, so let's look at some of the economics. I talked about there being no money fairy, um, so we need somehow to get money. Uh, I talked about this, I guess, in my, uh, my, my keynote. You know, you get an angel investor, you do some investment, and hopefully you build a cycle that grows strongly and allows us to invest in development, create more free software and happy customers. If we don't, we get less development and it all fails. Leads here being really the flow, the lifeblood of business. You know, how many people can you reach to turn into new customers? Of course, you can kill yourself in other ways by having poor marketing, poor sales strategy, whatever. But unless you get those, those leads, you're really stuffed. And at the moment, uh, we have the LibreOffice project creating a powerful product brand and marketing it as gratis in large part. Um, and it is, you know, it, it can't charge money for it in, uh, for, for various reasons. But creating this, this very powerful product brand makes it very hard for the rest of the ecosystem uh, to invest simply because where, where it competes with that, um, it, it's just very, very, very hard, 10 times more difficult than you might think. Um, so this is true for desktop. Uh, for online, of course, we previously had this firewall um, where we, we kind of had a source project you could collaborate around at LibreOffice and then, you know, competition and stress and aggro in the marketplace. Um, and this kind of semi-permeable membrane for investment and, and code. Uh, the new board, of course, changed this, uh, you know, wants, uh, wants a number of conflicting things. You know, the investment obviously is wanted. It, it should, of course, be called LibreOffice. It should come from TDF. It should be entirely gratis. We don't want any moral suasion to pretend, you know, persuade people to buy. Um, perhaps we should tell them they should donate to TDF. And we want to, you know, uh, if, if we can get leads, we want to redirect them to diversify contribution. Um, but again, we want corporate investment. So, so the connection between investment and return, um, if, of course, many of these desires conflict, lots of people don't share all of them, but all of these desires are well represented in the community and the board. Um, so, of course, we, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're a whole load of uh, cool kids, but we, uh, we disagree sometimes, and that's, I guess, normal. Um, but one of the thoughts on that is that um, if you're discussing in the community and prominent voices are saying, you know, it's a great idea to nationalize the oil industry, we should do that. Let's nationalize it next week. Um, this tends to have an impact on investment. People sell their shares in oil companies. They collapse in value. Um, People who put their money in are worried as to whether they'll get their money back if this happens. They'll wonder what's what's next. Perhaps we should be selling other stocks in the country that's nationalizing its oil industry. And of course, there's no problem with national oil industries. I, I have a beef against them. Um, well, or maybe maybe there are some problems with central planning and lack of focus and you know nine to five jobs worth and so on. But but either way, in theory, there's no problem with nationalized uh, industries. But it's the transition there and it's the uncertainty. Of course, if you want to nationalize your oil industry, it's great to create that uncertainty first because it's then much cheaper. You can destroy, you know, destroy the value of it and then you can buy it on the cheap, um, which is often you know, how it goes if indeed anything's bought at all. And of course, there are problems here because we want to have an inclusive community. We want to discuss everything. But I think if you're in a position of authority and responsibility, uh, it's helpful to approach these things with great sensitivity, given that your words have an impact that is perhaps long lasting and, and, and damaging and, and, and beyond, uh, you know, beyond what you might imagine. We're, we're talking large numbers of people's jobs and, you know, large economic flows. Uh, so it pays to be prudent. Um, so anyway, we came up with a marketing plan, perhaps to try and uh, solve this with this community tags and, and so on and so on. And lots of hard work there from Italo and the team. Um, significant resistance to the concept, concept uh, from the community, from the wider free software world and elsewhere. And I, I talked about this before, I think uh, there's probably no point in rehashing this. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, even if we can solve this in TDF, um, which perhaps we should anyway, the board is then going to be, you know, deciding whom to send those leads to. Uh, again, the leads are the lifeblood of a business uh, selling a product. And then, you know, we'll have all, uh, all of these potentially weak brands uh, trying to differentiate. You know, if everybody is calling it LibreOffice, if it's LibreOffice Enterprise everywhere, 
then again, we have this profound brand problem as the LibreOffice brand is used, you know, either as a 10x weapon for those who've contributed little against those who have, or just as a massive diluting factor if everyone uses it, such that it's then very hard to differentiate indeed, which ends up having a, driving the price down to zero effectively. It's like an, you know, an app store um, where there's lots of apparently identical products at different prices. So, you know, our solution, I guess it's this to, uh, you know, to, to do something simple and uh, pull it out uh, into, you know, collaborate online and have a clear brand message and, and get that sorted out. Of course, there's lots of other, other uh, solutions uh, to talk to. So just promote LibreOffice from TDF. This is one I, I love to hear. Um, people I talk to are full of brilliant ideas for corporate investment in growing the LibreOffice brand. I, I, I hear them regularly. All sorts of things that we, we can do as a company to grow LibreOffice as a brand. Problem is that there are very few convincing ideas on coupling any of that investment and work to any kind of return for the people putting the investment in. This is the piece that we're missing and the kryptonite that makes it uh, all work. Here is one of the ideas that I've heard, the love strategy. Good things will come, just wait. Uh, you know, community members over the years will promote our solutions through goodwill to their friends and companies, and they will then pay something. And of course, this does actually happen. You know, we're really grateful when that does happen. And, and you know, it, it is clearly the case that community members have, have, have sold things and, 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 and you know, encouraged people to buy stuff, and that's fantastic. And it's good to put that money back into the project. But broadly, our community is a tiny percentage of users that see the software. It's, I mean, you know, Pete, if you're in this conference, you are an amazingly cool person. You know, you, you have actually understood the message. You've, you've come and you've contributed and you're, you know, engaged with the project and so on and so on. And it's easy to forget that you are, well, if there are 200 million people and there's a thousand people in our community, um, you know, you are the 0.0001% of, or you know, half percent of, of the world. And that's cool. But it does seem like putting the burden of promoting, you know, the economic success of LibreOffice on your shoulders might be a bit of a misplaced idea. Like, wouldn't it be better to just to tell more of those 99.99999% that they might want to actually contribute effectively? And here is a great and easy way to do it uh, that works. Other solution I've heard recently is nationalization by TDF. Uh, so you turn TDF into a commercial development company hire a large permanent staff of developers, sell consultancy services, support products. Wouldn't it be exciting as us as a community to go on the journey of managing you know, a team of, of 40 engineers to do, do something? Well, perhaps. Um, so there are a few problems there in addition to the charitable purpose of TDF, uh, which is, yeah, well, anyway. Um, so community management ultimately comes down to some kind of board involvement, voting, elections, conflict, uh, we, we struggle at the moment as a board even to tender the things that have already been agreed by the community suggestion, ESC ranking, board voting process. Um, central planning uh, with a single price point, uh, a single team is not necessarily as efficient as you might hope. Mozilla has, has this problem. It makes it difficult to serve the whole world in different, different places. Of course, there's a bootstrapping problem. Currently, the developers are in companies primarily, and not in TDF, uh, and TDF has no, not got the budget to pay them, so we would potentially lose a lot of skills on the way. And in addition, we'd permanently end any external investment. So we would, we would put all of our eggs in a single basket marked TDF. It's possible. I just don't know how wise that would be as an approach. Well, I think if you look at Mozilla and Mozilla's monolithic approach to building its product and competing in the marketplace, I think you see the end result of exactly this model. So other stuff, well, loosely coupled third party players, why loosely coupled? Well, it, you know, this could fill a niche like the PC App Store. Uh, lots of people looked at TDC, for example, and said, whoa, it's very loosely coupled. I'm really worried about that. We should own and control it. The problem is when you own and control it, a lot of those requirements around your mission and, and your nonprofit uh, status get pushed across that ownership a thing and ultimately selling apps in app stores and reinvesting the proceeds becomes in my view significantly more complicated and, and there are problems there too because if we put gratis apps in app stores 
And we potentially stop people getting updates from TDF. And our donation flow is highly coupled to the update flow, or at least has been. And then, of course, there are issues that if you create a privileged third party which owns this product brand LibreOffice, does that chew up the whole ecosystem you know, in a similar way? Anyway, I hope none of these ideas are especially new. I'll try and persuade you they're not. In, in 2012, I gave a talk, Interaction Anti-Patterns, talking essentially about the problems here. And here's what I said. The economics of the ecosystem are critical. If we can't get the flow of code and finance right, we fail. Um, this was, I guess, shortly after losing uh, Sun and uh, Oracle and IBM. Um, freed riders need to join the community and enjoy the ride. Yeah, yeah. 2013. Uh, the governance and economics and ecosystem. You can see the slide here. Unfortunately, Lanido and Egalia are no longer with us and investing in the ecosystem and Magenta is no longer with us either. Um, yeah, which, which just shows you the consequences of not getting the economics right of your ecosystem or not as good as they could be. Uh, 2014, the Burn keynote, the money fairy appeared. I spent ages drawing that thing. Look at, look at the tux with the wings, fantastic. Um, so this is not a new idea, it's just an idea that I repeatedly talk about at conferences and results in remarkably little progress, although there has been some progress. Let me show you uh, that. So we now have a LibreOffice and business page, which is great. Um, and, and weirdly, if you give a very small donation to TDF to become an advisory board member of your 500 pounds, you can appear, or 500 euros, you can appear on this page, um, which is quite a strange incentive. But, but either way, it's, it's a positive thing to have uh, LibreOffice and business page and encourage people uh, to go there. And if you look at the stats from Matomo for this year, this is actually uh, pretty cool. So like there's uh, 61,000 hits on that page out of the 12 million um, that we got. This is unique uh, page views. Uh, the professional support page is I got 17,000. And encouraging, there's a, there's a good exit rate from that page. Like if you're looking at the people go, who go on to pick any kind of professional support or find out about it, like most of the people who hit that page uh, go somewhere useful. Um, yeah, of course, very few of the people who hit the LibreOffice and business page go somewhere useful. Um, but these are positive numbers. We had something like 0.15% in 2018, 0.23%, and a big jump to 0.65% of people um, that, that go to our website actually find one of these pages, like the certified developers page, the professional support page. Of course, then it's not clear that a large number of them go on, but this is something to celebrate. Hopefully, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be pleased. And here's what 0.65% looks like. So this is the ratio of volunteers to uh, companies in terms of commits in the project at the moment. And this is what it looks like. So it's, it's pretty good in terms of, uh, you know, growing share of the pie chart. Arguably the blue share should more clearly match uh, this chart. But, but we're at least going somewhere, which is good. And uh, the pace of going somewhere is accelerating. It's just rather a small, small thing. And indeed, on the website, we've encouraged people to think less of uh, gratis free stuff. And now we're thinking that perhaps you ought to switch from uh, open office, which is, well, you know, hey, positive. One of the things I've been trying to persuade people is that we need a big, grateful community. Here is a, an IRC discussion recently. Um, that shows that this is not just a problem for the marketing team. We, we need to be thinking about this everywhere and telling people that things are good. And, and, and I don't want to pick on these guys because they're, they're both awesome. Um, so I have carefully renamed them to Helpful and Hero. Um, but uh, you know, don't, don't, don't wait for the board. Don't, don't wait, tell people. Tell people if something has gone well, if someone's contributed something, even if it's a company like uh, Adfinis, who, who did an awesome job with the uh, the crash testing system, we might want to actually tell someone, we want to celebrate it, have a party. And maybe if we encourage them enough, they'll do more. Or maybe someone else will do more. It's not really qualitatively different from a volunteer. I think we need to do more of that. And my conclusions. Economics is important. Ultimately, I would argue we lost Oracle and IBM because there was no strong economic driver to keep them in the project. It didn't make money. Uh, Red Hat, of course, has reduced its investment. SUSE has, well, uh, spun stuff out. The Galia, Lanido, I could go on. There's a great long list of them. People tend not to divest, particularly in small companies, if there is a strong economic driver. If we can get that, we will grow our community uh, of contributors, and we will be more diverse, and we'll have fun. Be aware of contributors' economic interests. Just because someone is saying it should all be free and it's gratis, it doesn't mean that they're a good guy. It could mean 
maybe they're a good guy, but it could mean that they have an economic incentive to have a free complement to their service, product, whatever. And they don't want people to know that perhaps they ought to be contributing financially to the core. Just be aware of that. Um, building a commercial product brand inside a nonprofit that can't exploit that to earn money um, is, I think, an unfortunate marketing choice. And I think we need to think more about how far down that product, product route we want to go, because we can't sell a product. We can only stop other people buying other products uh, with that. Of course, there's a value in, in, in telling people about software freedom and getting more people to use it. But I think we need to be careful. And I think we need to build virtuous cycles. Those who contribute should be appreciated and promoted, whoever they are. Those who strip mine should not be. And it should be fun for companies to contribute to the project uh, as it should be for individuals. So that's my talk. I think I have one second left. And if there's time for questions, I'd love to take some. And hopefully some, someone saw, saw the talk. Uh, is there anyone listening still? Perhaps there's some yes. chat, chat this, questions here. This, sure. is, this is a really interesting um, conversation. And I was one of those people who kind of thought of, well, maybe it should be part of you know, TDF as a whole and the LibreOffice vanilla thing. But I think you kind of shown, you, know, you kind of threw to my face that there's a really good reason why there's a brand split and why and why it makes sense to encourage um, multiple entities to invest and commercialize and then contribute back. Uh, and, and it reminded me very much of in the, in the years ago when the Red Hat Fedora brand split occurred um, for Red Hat Enterprise mm -hmm. Linux and Fedora. Yep. Yep. Um, I wonder if maybe this is the lesson that we need to actually learn as a community and I wonder like what, what your thoughts are on the idea of maybe codifying for TDF and LibreOffice effectively a total brand split for commercialization purposes. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's helpful. Um, so, so, you know, if, you know, I don't have a magic wand. I don't know what works. I, I, I can't predict the future any better than anyone else. I, they, you know, I, I have a little bit of experience of trying to sell something. And, and, and paying people to do open source software. But it, it seems to me that across the free software world, we have a problem encouraging people to pay for things. And it's a, it's a pretty rampant problem. And I would argue that having a clear brand thing, like, like the LibreOffice Personal or, or whatever it is, that applies moral suasion, not just in our project, but in all projects. I mean, like Ubuntu Personal versus Ubuntu Enterprise. Now, this is weird because there's a single corporate entity that owns that brand. Um, I don't think LibreOffice Enterprise is a good idea because it destroys differentiation by multiple players in the ecosystem. But I think LibreOffice Personal is a good idea. I mean, you know, I, I, I think possibly we could go with unsupported or something. I mean, I, I don't know what it is, but, but I think a tag is a good idea to encourage people that actually contribution is important. And and I think that's something that, particularly in LibreOffice, with, with such a large user base and such a, you know, a cool community, it's, it's a large community, but it's a tiny fraction of that, um, we could really do, do more to uh, encourage. I think it's a pattern that lots of projects would uh, win from. So thank you for your point and question. It's getting boring. 50% of my talks since 2014 have the same topic. I know, I know. Yeah, so Andreas makes a good point. I mean, I, I don't know how often you can say something and, and be ignored, but it, I, I'm going for a record in this, uh, you know. <laughs> no. I, mean, I think other people have different views and, you know, it's very difficult to affect any meaningful change in, in our project uh, for lots of reasons. Um, but hopefully we have an opportunity now on a bit of a wake up call to try and think these things through in, in a way that, you know, uh, allows us to change. That would be my take, but let's see. Other questions, thoughts, feedback? How am I doing for time? Am I, I guess I'm probably out of it. But... So one okay. last question, and this one might hit a little close to home. What do you think of the SUSE versus OpenSUSE brand split for, for this same kind of uh, differentiation kind of purpose as you were talking about throughout your presentation? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, mean, I think it's a really good, uh, it, well, so, so I think the SUSE case is, is relatively different because uh, LibreOffice really tries to be a vendor neutral nonprofit. And I think building a product brand that it owns 
for paid for product would be deeply unhelpful. Um, but, but in the CESA case, I think it's really, really cool. And of course, Open CESA then allows people to be involved and, and CESA is really open and has a, has a cool community that, well, is, it's, that's what it says on the tin, is open, right? Um, but then of course, it, it pushes the CESA brand too. So, so every time you talk about Open CESA, you talk about CESA who, who do just fantastic work, you know, building infrastructure and tooling and you know, contributing and, and making it possible for everyone to collaborate around that. So I think you know there are nuances there, but I, th I think it's good to have that brand separation, and I, and I expect to see it increasingly in things. I mean, so we see Nextcloud and Nextcloud Enterprise now. We see uh, you know and Cloud, I guess, have had have a similar separation. I think you know the the kind of discussion we had at LibreOffice was not one about removing features. It was not about proprietary anything. You know, it was not about license change or, or any such thing. It was merely about tagging the software to say it's not suitable for use in, well, all, many of those places where people have a complementary, uh, you know, uh, service. They shouldn't be selling LibreOffice uh, unless they're actually contributing back, you know, and I think putting that message, embedding it in the product name is, is very, very, very helpful uh, thing to do, in my view, but your mileage may vary. So, Michael, uh, on time, um, Thorsten's going to be uh up next and he, his talk starts in about nine minutes oh nine minutes oh we got some time for questions then you, you do and if, if you want to introduce them you're more than welcome to do that so torsten is awesome i i, I you know like torsten is just great you should listen to his talk and uh yeah you know, i gave a list of people that actually contribute back to the ecosystem and, and cid is is well up there so you know you should uh, i don't know what he's talking about he's probably talking about you know why collabora sucks but but either way you should listen to that too uh, there's probably some uh, you know something useful to find out there um, but yeah, sure. Happy to ramble until Torsten gets on. Um, any other questions or thoughts? I mean, I know it's an emotive mm -hmm. topic. And a... Yeah. So, so maybe if you can hear me, um, one, yeah. one, uh, one comment. So, so broadly behind um, um, the, the, the the statements here, and and you know that, um, and, and I'm kind of in the same boat there. Uh, and we all struggle uh, to uh, to make a living uh, out of open source. So, so that I'm, I'm perfectly behind that that part but what i find slightly unhelpful is, is kind of slamming other people for, for especially tf in this case uh, for for not acknowledging where, where the where the code comes from we're all making that mistake i mean we all always tend to to market our own um um things that we did and then that applies to all of us and i, I really liked that you said well actually with the with uh, running Linux on the servers and on, on our uh, workstations, and we're not uh, paying anyone for that as well. And I think it's probably fair to say that that same story is there with uh, acknowledging the past. And that, that's my statement from the chat that um, so much value was created by um, by people before us. Okay. Um, that slamming TDF for and there was a, I mean, there was a decision that we all made back in the day and then 2011 to market a product because that's what open office was back in the day. So we marketed against open office. And then after that, we realized that um, there was no, no money ferry as you, as you said <laughs> in 2013. So, so it actually evolved. And I think that's the, this, this not looking back and not, not really necessarily uh, and TDF is not this, this, this amorphous entity. I mean, we're all a part of that and we're all kind of um, at least partially involved in that decision making and instead looking forward and after 10 years saying, okay, damn it. I mean, all of open source land has the same problem and we got to monetize and, 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 and in a positive way, look forward instead of looking back and blaming somebody else. Oh, indeed, indeed. Um, but I, I think um, <laughs> I think there are many suggestions that uh, that come across that are of the form, let's go further this way, let's, you know, I, I don't know which, which bits particularly annoying, but hey, I'll tweak my slides before publishing them if you have, if you have a good uh, tweak. My, my take is not to, you know, sort of get at individuals or, or, or things around that, but just to sort of paint uh, the story of what, what, what's happened there, and I think that helps inform future decisions. Uh, if, if that makes sense. It was clearly a collective mistake in, in hindsight um, that, that we marketed as a free office feedback in the day. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so, but but I, you say it's clear, but but I, I don't know that. Yeah, I mean, it's a good summary. 
<laughs> so I misspoke. It's actually Lodar is going to be uh, uh, doing the closing. Oh, Luther is doing the closing. Yes, I, I thought that was the case. Yeah. I think Luther is with us. Maybe, it's, maybe we have TDF, Mark. I mean, Mike, you're here. Do you, I mean, you know, it's an easy message, right? Free office suite is, is an easy one to get across, right? Um, yeah, we have been removing free. I removed it from some things on Twitter. We don't talk about it so much. I mean, the, the job of the, um, of the Document Foundation is, is to promote this development of an office suite available for everybody. Um, but I, I do agree that always talking about free, free, free kind of, for many people, stops the conversation or, or people don't even think about where does it come from. A lot of people just assume it, it does come out of thin air by magic or a few volunteers. So uh, we have been toning down the mentions of free um, and uh, We've been, yeah, Michael showed the uh, business in uh, LibreOffice in business sites as well, which only gets a tiny number of visits, but we're looking at oh, updates. Brilliant. It's brilliant. updates. That's positive yeah, brilliant. but th there's still more we can do. We're looking at the download page as well and, and segmenting users. Like we don't want to change what we offer, of course, as TDF, we want to offer this, this office suite, but um, really making sure the business users know, at least know that there's, there are things out there that, that they really should be installing and using if they're deploying on 10,000 computers um and and feeding something back as well so um it's that finding that balance that we've talked about before between what what we do as tdf but also supporting the ecosystem i agree because without the ecosystem we wouldn't have half of the features we get so um uh yeah so i i've got so this seems to remind me a lot of you know i i think about the other ecosystems that i'm involved in and one of them that comes to mind is the you know the cncf and linux foundation with their model like yeah you can download it for free in the source code and binaries or whatever but they kind of make the first pass landing page take you to what they call certified platforms which you can pay for or get support for and things like that um i've looked at the LibreOffice website recently and i don't really see an equivalent to that has anyone discussed the idea of doing something like that to like maybe make it so that people can pass through easily to Collabora Office or Collabora Online or, or you know, LibreOffice by CIB or whatever? So it has been discussed and uh, there's a marketing plan that includes some of that as, you know, with an unclear, relatively unclear mechanism there for how that would work. Um, but what was the, the model project that you were, what was the project that you were suggesting? Uh, this is like Kubernetes and the Cloud Native Kubernetes. Linux, Foundation, yeah. Linux Foundation stuff. Like they do yeah. this a lot where they, People that sponsor or active members um, corporate wise that provide solutions based on the open source projects. Um, when you go through to their site and go figure out like how to get Kubernetes, quote unquote, they kind of they promote at the top level the certified Kubernetes distribution. With yeah, that's great. So, so I guess they, they have a source a source project with binary distributions from lots of different players, right? They also do the binary distribution themselves, but it is marked it, it doesn't have the quote unquote certified Kubernetes kind of branding around no, it. Right. That's interesting. So so they effectively promote their own product as less authentic than the other ones elsewhere, right? Yeah, that's I, it's a very but... weird way to describe it, but yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I've not not seen that approach, but uh, certainly the the problem that we have at the moment is that TDF builds are seen as the ultimate in authenticity and and the genuine source of all sorts of goodness, which is created by other people, um, which is a little bit um, a bit annoying if you correct it. Much of that. Well, as you said, there's no money fairy. There isn't, and I, I hope we can you know uh, agree on that if if nothing else. <laughs> Good. So, any other questions or thoughts? Or well, and when is Luther on then? When is his uh, 